You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 4th, 2023. Our topic today, Genetic Evaluation and Interpretation of Genetic Variants for Inborn Errors of Immunity. Our presenter is Dr. Manish Butte. He's the E. Richard Stein Endowed Chair, Professor and Division Chief in the Division of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology at the UCLA School of Medicine in Los Angeles, California. All right, so uh, good morning to our listening audience. Welcome to Conferences Online and Allergy. It is August 4th. Um, Our second topic of the day is with Dr. Manish Butte. And Dr. Butte is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UCLA. Uh, He's got joint appointments in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and then Molecular Genetics with Human Genetics. Um, He's also the, uh, in pediatrics, pediatrics, he's the chief in the Division of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology. Um, Today, he is going to be speaking on genetic evaluation and interpretation of genetic variants for inborn errors of immunity. Um, Appreciate you being here. Um, Are you familiar with how to share your screen at this point? Yes, it should be like this. Does that work? Uh, it's it's work. Yep, we've got your screen now. And now, if I hit play, do you see a full screen? Does it look okay? Can somebody unmute and say it's okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay, it's good. good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Milan. Thank you all for joining. I um, I see some of the UCLA people on on the Zoom here uh, teams, and um, you know I, some of you apologies then might have heard some of these uh, talks and slides before, but uh, I'm going to try to share sort of a broader perspective about genetic testing in inborn errors of immunity, and um, try to delve a little bit into variants of unknown significance, which is something that's going to plague you as you order genetic tests, and then also dive a little bit into gain of function. Uh, variants, these these relatively newer disorders that are uh, not loss of function, but gain of function and, and the kind of treatments that we, we have to think about um, as we do genetic tests and, and reveal these disorders. So, um, you know, I want to try to share sort of what are the learning uh, objectives here, the benefits of testing, what kind of tests there are, uh, what do they miss, how, how do we uh, work through the various tests to make a, a genetic diagnosis, and then uh, how to work up VOSs. Um, or, uh, there'll be a little bit of a pipeline approach, but uh, maybe giving you an idea of how, how we think about these things. Um, the big high level take home points are that everyone with an inborn error of immunity should get a genetic diagnosis. These, that's because these diseases, for the most part, almost all of them are monogenic diseases. They are genetic diseases and the patients deserve a genetic diagnosis. Uh, it will help you to diagnose and treat these disorders if you do genetic testing. Um, Immunologists now have to be extremely conversant with genetic testing. It is absolutely a mainstay of our field at this point. Every patient gets a genetic test, um, again, but almost without exception. Uh, Another key point is that as you work on these genetic disorders, you're going to hear this mantra, and you should say it in the back of your mind uh, again and again, that rare diseases require rare variants. What that means is that you're working on patients who have extraordinarily rare phenotypes. Somebody who shows up with, you know, sepsis due to group A strep. That is insanely rare. There are only a few patients uh, in the country at any time suffering from that fate. Um, You know, uh, someone who has um, herpes encephalitis, you know, whatever infectious phenotype or uh, severe fevers that come and go. These are rare disorders, one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand patients, one in a million for many of them. A PDS, for example, one in a million patients has that disease. Uh, These are super rare diseases. So if you're doing genetic testing and the genetic variants you're looking for or that you find um, are commonly seen in humans, 3% of all humans have this variant, 5,000 humans have this variant, you have to say to yourself, that's really unlikely to be the cause of a genetic disease. A rare disease requires the variant that you want to explain the disease with to be rare itself. And we use population databases to help us understand how rare a variant is. 
you need to be very conversant with these population databases. The one that we all use um, almost every day is one called Nomad, and you should become very familiar with Nomad. I'll show you some screenshots and stuff from Nomad. A third key take home point is that um, back in the era when I trained, we used to think about one gene and one phenotype or one disease. For example, there may be a little boy who has uh, a low platelets and also some immune dysfunction, uh, maybe infection susceptibility. We would link that, especially if there's a phenotype of eczema with Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, the gene uh, called Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome protein. We no longer think this way, that there is one gene leading to one phenotype. As you'll hear over the course of this talk, there are many, many, many dozens of genes now that have multiple phenotypes attached to them. Uh, we also really understand that many phenotypes can be, uh, one phenotype can be explained by many genes uh, in a pathway. For example, we know that WASP works with WIP, a protein called WIP, and WIP deficiency and WASP deficiency are actually quite similar to each other. So if you see a patient with low platelets and eczema and infections, instead of thinking about WASP and, or WIP as individual genes to explain the phenotype, think about the pathway that's involved, how these genes and proteins work together to create a, a biochemical pathway. That pathway may be disrupted uh, by one of the genes in the pathway. That's going to be a more tractable approach as you start to get learn about these genetics um, and get overwhelmed by them. There are 500 genetic disorders now over uh, in our field, and you, it is impossible to keep track of them. Uh, it's better for you to start diving into these disorders in terms of their pathways, what pathways are affected, not what how to memorize the uh, phenotypes of individual genes. That doesn't work. Uh, and the last key take on point is that variants of unknown significance are not meant to be ignored. Uh, absolutely need to dive into them and understand them and study them. And I'm going to walk you through how to do that. But the key, one of the key take home points is that functional testing trumps everything. OK, so as we get into testing, so I would encourage you all to sort of be able to unmute and share your questions with me. Um, don't wait to the end. There's going to be a lot of stuff here. And you know, the more you can feel comfortable just raising your hand and asking, the more other people around you uh, on, online uh, will also appreciate that question being asked. But so let me just jump in. So the kinds of testing that we often do are single gene tests um, or, or gene panels or exome or genome or chromosomal microarray. Uh, I encourage you to really never use single gene testing except for one situation, which is if there is a familial variant, if there is a family where that has X-linked skid and a new baby boy is born, you may say, okay, uh, this baby has very low T cells and I'm going to just test the familial variant that the other brother had uh, instead of doing a more broad uh, survey of, of other genes. I think that's an ex that's a good use of single gene testing. Otherwise, there is no good use of single gene testing. And just to hammer home this point, single gene testing is very expensive compared to the other tests that you're seeing here because it's it requires a lot of human labor. Um, the other Tests as we go down the list here um, become more useful. Gene panels by far and away are the most useful. These are quick and cheap. Typically about 10 to 14 days you'll get an answer back and they're about 250 bucks. That is very, very cheap and gets you an answer very quickly. And in some disorders like SCID where uh, many, if not most of the genes have already been figured out, we can solve 80 to 90% of SCID cases from a gene panel uh, within two weeks. That is the kind of timing and accuracy that gets you uh, planning for the bone marrow transplant that you need when you work up SCID babies in the first month of life. Um, and it's uh, definitely the way to go. However, gene panels are the moment they're released into the wild and, and become commercially accessible, they are out of date. The gene panels that you can order today reflect the genes that were clinically described a year ago. And the 50 new genes that were described since then haven't made it on the gene panel. And so they're always out of date. Uh, what isn't out of date is if you sequence everything, then you get all the genes. And the, the next test, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing are, are those kinds of tests. And I'll walk you through those, but you know, a high level point is that exome sequencing is also laborious. It takes a lot of human labor to do. And humans are expensive in America. And so uh, whole exome sequencing will likely go away because whole genome sequencing is now cheaper than exome sequencing and requires much less labor. It can be fully automated with a robot, requires almost no human uh, intervention. And so we expect whole exome sequencing will go away um, uh, over the next couple of years, maybe even this year. 
Chromosomal microarrays are another kind of test, and that's key only for the large chromosomal disorders. The main one that you'll end up seeing is uh, DeGeorge syndrome, 22Q11 deletion syndrome. Uh, that one needs to be tested with chromosomal microarrays. Please don't order fish testing, a very old school hybridization test that's really not um, uh, sensitive enough for many of the 22Q11 deletion syndrome uh, variants that are out there. There's also um, trisomy 21 and a few other diseases that can be diagnosed by chromosomal microarrays and not by the uh, tests above. Okay, so hopefully you're familiar with all these kinds of tests and what their uses are. Um, who needs, who, when you really need to prioritize who needs genetic testing, think about the patients who are consanguineous. All of them should get genetic testing because they may have a, an autosomal recessive disease. Think about patients who have a very unusual phenotype or a severe phenotype, someone who has West Nile virus encephalitis, uh, you know, someone who has lymphoproliferative disorders. Many of them may benefit from uh, genetic testing because you, you'll, you may have an autosomal dominant or a de novo disease, uh, even if there's no family history at all. Uh, patients with severe phenotypes need to have uh, genetic testing. And then any patient where the treatment could be altered if genetic testing were available, um, should get genetic testing. Uh, we know from studies from Houston and from Europe that about at least a third, maybe a little bit more of patients who get genetic testing have changes in their clinical planning as, uh, as a result of the genetic test. And so we really do feel that almost every patient with an inborn nerve immunity phenotype needs to get genetic testing. The other uh, things that your patient that you'll benefit from genetic testing for uh, by doing includes ending the patient's diagnostic odyssey. Many of these patients have a, a sense of anxiety as they work up their weird infections, weird fevers, and autoimmunity, et cetera. And to give them an answer, even if it's not treatable, to give them an answer and say the reason you have this. Uh, infection susceptibility, this low B cells, these weird antibodies, uh, is because of this genetic disorder. It brings a tremendous sense of relief to the patients. This has been studied uh, time and again through the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Uh, that diagnostic odyssey is a huge source of anxiety for our patients, and you can relieve that. It also reduces unnecessary testing. We know from the UDN that patients undergo many, many, many unnecessary tests along their diagnostic odyssey. Once a genetic diagnosis is obtained, oftentimes it reduces some of that. Uh, it gives you an ACE card to pay against your payers. The payers, you know, the Blue Crosses and Anthems and, and United Healthcare's of this world who are, who are insanely antagonistic against rare diseases, don't want to pay for any of the treatments that you want to trip prescribe. Uh, they are going to wither when you show the ACE card of a genetic test where you say, this is my, what my patient has and this is why they need this. Uh, and to be able to point to literature around those genetic disorders and the treatments uh, gives you tremendous firepower as they try to say no to you. Um, it gives you the chance to do family planning with the patients. Many of the patients want to have additional children, but don't want their children to be affected by the uh, genetic diseases. You can do, offer them things like in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. We just went through this at UCLA. One of our um, parents decided to have a second child who was unaffected by a dominant genetic disease, and they did it through PGD, and it worked very, very well. Uh, this is a 20-year-old technology. This is not science fiction and definitely can be done for your patients too if you can give them a gene. Uh, the last is uh, on here is that you can pick targeted therapies. As you'll see from the gain-of-function disorders later in the talk, that many of our diseases can be molecularly targeted now with inhibitors, and that gives a lot of firepower to your ability to treat their diseases beyond just giving them the kinds of immunosuppression, like with steroids or rituximab, that, um, that our colleagues in hematology and rheumatology may choose sort of empirically rather than targetedly. And so, having the gene gives you that kind of uh, firepower. So genome sequencing, exome sequencing, you know, are, are, are sequencing the whole, uh, all the exons of all the coding regions of all the genes, uh, six billion bases for genome sequencing that includes all the intronic and intragenic regions, and exome sequencing avoids all that and just sequences the 2% of the genome that codes for exons. There are also, um, and gene panels are a subset of that. There are also these things called genotyping chips that are run by 23andMe or Ancestry.com. They do not contain rare variants. They are not useful for rare disease diagnosis. Uh, we really don't recommend patients wasting 100 bucks uh, on, on those kinds of tests unless they're interested in entertainment or into ancestry. Okay, so exome sequencing really after gene panels, and, and again, gene panels are, are far and away what you're gonna go to first uh, because they provide an answer quickly and cheaply. 
Uh, exome sequencing, on the other hand, um, is what you'll go to after that. Beware that there are many, many companies now that are offering exome sequencing for cheap, and they are fly by night, and they may not know what they're doing, um, and they really need to have some additional scrutiny up, uh, applied, and, and it's your responsibility to do that. You may have to look at things like how much coverage is offered. You may have to do it th things like look at what kind of reports they generate. Do they share data? Um, and and at some point, you know, you may say, "Geez, this outfit really isn't good enough for for my patients. I want to do something that's maybe a little more costly, but offers a better test." Because um, most of the coding regions are captured in exon sequen exome sequencing and most genetic diseases affect the coding regions of proteins. Uh, the, the estimate from now 20 years ago, uh, which has held up, is that about 85% of genetic diseases can be diagnosed uh, by just by looking at the exons. Uh, we now know that there are many, many, many um, genetic diseases in the introns and in the intragenic regions and the promoter regions that are not covered by exome sequencing. Uh, so just be aware that you're not gonna find all the answers, but a lot of the genetic diseases can be found. For example, if a mutation or a variant occurs in an intron that affects the splicing of a gene, that may not show up on exome sequencing. You may need to go into genome sequencing or RNA sequencing in order to identify those kinds of variants. The other thing that exome sequencing misses is a deletion where an entire exon is clipped out that just doesn't show up on exome sequencing, and you may need to move again to genome or to chromosomal microarrays, depending on the size of the deletions. Um, the other, yeah, the other point down at the bottom, and this you know needs to be reiterated over and over and over again, is that when you approach patients to say you're going to be doing genetic testing, you need to have a discussion with them about the yield of this test. In general, our ability to analyze exomes and genomes and RNA sequencing and provide genetic diagnoses is still poor. Uh, we give about a 30% success rate. Uh, and for consanguineous families, it's much higher, 60, 70, 80 percent. For certain diseases where we've really beaten the genetics out of the disease, like SCID, it's much higher still, 80, 90 percent. But for the common um, rare diseases that you're going to see out there, like the CVID phenotype, the success rate is much lower. Uh, and you just need to be aware, we don't know all the genes, we don't know all the pathways, we don't know how to analyze these data to really give us the answers yet. Um, if you do an exome sequence after a gene panel and you don't get an answer, you can call the company that did or the lab and ask them, what genes did you look at? So what does that mean? The exome sequence, although they sequence all 20,000 genes, they don't actually look at the variants in all 20,000 genes. It's just too much. They're hundreds of thousands, 50, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of variants. It's too much for any software, any person to look at. And so they narrow the gene list down to a smaller number of genes. And that smaller number of genes is driven by what you tell them. If you tell them that this patient has neutropenia, they're going to look at the narrower set of genes related to neutrophils. If you're going to tell them that there's fungal infections, they may look at the set of genes that are related to fungal infections. They're making up that set of genes, by the way. They don't know necessarily all the genes related to fungal infections. Nobody does. But they're going to pick a narrower set of genes based on the phenotype you give them. And they're going to use something called HPO mapping, human phenotype ontology mapping, to map the, the term fungal infection to a set of genes. That doesn't always work. It's actually a really crude process. And so, you know, I encourage you to um, apply a little bit of, of caution and ask them and say, or which genes did you look at? Did you include these other ones? Uh, and, and go back and just make sure that they really have looked at all the genes that you want them to look at. The other thing is not every gene is covered well. I'm going to show you a picture of that in, in a few minutes. Uh, and ask them if the read depth, the amount of reads that they actually got for each exon is actually uh, sufficient. You can also ask them if they can include any variants in genes that aren't clinical genes, not the 500 known IEI genes, but the thousands other genes that are adjacent to them. Can they ask you to include, you can ask them to include those genes in the report so that you might be able to get a better chance of, uh, of a pathway that's affected, even if it's not a known gene. And you could also move on to exome sequencing, uh, to genome sequencing if exome is just unrevealing. Okay, so I'm going to, oops, uh, that, yeah, okay, so let me go back here. So, um, 
this is a, a figure showing uh, the utility of, of, of genome sequencing when it's combined with RNA sequencing. This is the approach that we take here at UCLA for patients where the gene panels are not sufficient um, and where exome is not sufficient. So here at the top is the coding sequence of a gene. Hopefully you can all see my pointer. Um, these are exons here, untranslated exons in blue, untranslated exons in blue here, and then the four coding exons in yellow, red, green, and blue. Uh, when they are spliced together in the right way, you end up with a transcript that includes the uncoding, untranslated exons and the coding uh, exons. Eventually, through translation at the ribosome, that forms a protein that has activity. Now, let's say the key activity of this enzyme is in the red exon. That's where the catalytic site is, where it chews up some um, substrate and turns it into something else. If there is a, um, if there's a, Come on. If there's a mutation in this intron here, not in the coding sequence, but in the intron, then you may end up with a weird splicing pattern where the red exon is not included in the splicing, in which case you'll end up with a transcript that looks like this, yellow, green, blue, missing the red, and the protein that's formed lacks the enzymatic activity. Now, the important thing is that this variant lying in the intron is in invisible to exome sequencing, invisible to gene panels. And you may not get back any answer if you do an exome or a gene panel, you send the blood to Invitae and you get nothing back. You have to think about these kinds of variants and they're occurring more and more and more and more. These RNA variants are really becoming a major portion of our, of our workup. 15, 20, 30% of our, of our disorders are probably being missed because of this. This RNA sequencing variant, uh, sorry, the DNA sequencing variant, if you found in the genome, in the intron here, a variant, you may not know what to do with it. Some of these introns are tens of thousands of bases big. And to find a T that switched to a U, uh, to an A in this region, that may not mean anything to you. You may not know what that deep intronic variant means unless you add on RNA sequencing and sequence all these transcripts. Once you look at the transcript, you'll immediately say, hey, look, this transcript is missing red. We expected the transcript to contain red exon. It's missing here. Aha, let's go back to the genome and see, oh, look, there's a variant in the genome here in the intron, and that explains why the red exon was not spliced properly. And then you've made a genetic diagnosis and you've explained a genetic disease. This is a very important. This is the way that we move forward through the, the unsolved cases right now. So an example of exome sequencing uh, that is improved by genome sequencing, and there are about 30 genes, I'm going to show you them in a second, is shown here graphically. This is a screenshot from Nomad. Nomad is that browser that I mentioned to you that you're going to need to be familiar with if you want to know which variants occur rarely. This has all the known variants in, in 200,000 people who've been sequenced, and it gives you a very good chance of understanding which variants are common and which variants are rare uh, from, from this database. Very easy to use, graphical interface, just type in the name of a gene and boom, a lot of stuff starts popping up. This is an example of a CVID phenotype gene called RELB, and this gene has um, poor coverage by exome sequencing. So what you see here are exons, these black things are exons, and above it are the coding regions uh, that, that are covered by these exons in exome sequencing in blue and genome sequencing in green. So one thing you can see in exome sequencing is like a mound of, of blue here that's centered around an exon. That's what they did. When they do exome sequencing, they built the exome sequencing so that it captures all these reads that surround this exon. And so the whole coding region of the exon is covered very well here. Uh, in fact, by, on average, about 85 times for this exon. Exon Here in the middle of this exon, it's covered about 45 times. So you can see the number of reads is very deep for some of these exons and less for some other exons. For some exons, like this exon and this exon, the exomic reads are very low. Here, there's only about 10 reads in this exon, and here about the same. That does not give you enough coverage to make rare diagnoses, and oftentimes you'll miss diagnoses if a mutation, a variant occurs here or here. So uh, genome sequencing, on the other hand, you can see is relatively uniform. You can see here the green is, is about 30 reads across the whole genome, including all the introns. One end of the genome to the other is covered on average by about 30 reads. So it gives you a, a really a generous ability to find uh, variants, even in exons that are not covered well by exome sequencing. 
So there are about 30 genes that are not covered well by exome sequencing. Some of them are dramatically improved by genome sequencing. Uh, and we're trying to publish some of this work. This is a collaborative work between my group and Sarah Henriksen's. Um, okay, so you, you've done your exome sequencing or you've done genome sequencing and you now have a report uh, and you may have at the end of that report a clear answer. That's it, you're done. What does that mean? That means you have a known pathogenic variant in a known disease causing gene and the variant and the gene matches the phenotype of your patient. I have a variant, the variant is a loss of function variant and it's a loss of function disease and it's recessive and the mom and the dad are unaffected, but there's two siblings. If everything matches well, you're done. You have a clear answer. And remember, this only happens about 20 or 30% of the time. The other 80% of the time is this other stuff that makes our lives still challenging and fun uh, is uh, includes that if you have a new variant in a gene that's already known, but the variant isn't known to cause disease, that's called a variant of unknown significance, and you have to start figuring out the significance of it. Or you may have a new variant in a gene that's not yet known to link to human disease, but it's in the right pathway. You may say, oh my gosh, this is a totally new gene, but it's in a gene in a pathway right next to a gene that we really understand and know very well. For example, IL-7 receptor deficiency causes SCID, uh, a T cell deficiency, but B cells and NK cells are intact, form a SCID. IL-7, the, the cytokine for IL-7 receptor deficiency has never been described. There are no humans lacking IL-7 who have a T minus SCID. We're just waiting for those patients to show up, by the way. They will show up and we'll sequence them and we'll get that answer at some point. But if you found a patient with a SCID phenotype and who has a variant, a novel variant in a gene without a known link, IL-7, but you're saying, oh my gosh, this makes total biological sense. It's the cytokine for the receptor. This is gonna be the cause of the SCID. So, but the, uh, for now, these are variants of unknown significance and we need to work them up. Um, so how are you going to work up these new variants? First of all, and most importantly, when you get back a genome, exome, or gene panel report, ask, is this variant possibly related to the phenotype? Many of the genes that we work on have a description, have some science attached to them, uh, and you can find that in PubMed, you can find that on Google Scholar, you can find that in a variety of papers, and try to just ask, is this gene related to the things I'm seeing in the patient? I'm seeing a patient with fungal immunity, uh, fungal infections, and I'm going to ask, is this gene expressed in any of the cells that like are important? Is this is this gene actually uh, been published? If somebody knocked it out in a mouse, does it affect fungal immunity in mice? You can try to understand the clinical phenotype of the patient and see if it's linked to the gene. That's going to be very important. Those are the ones you want to work on most. So how do you know which genes to work on and which genes and pathways to work on? This is the key paper. This is the published in Journal of Clinical Immunology. It's published uh, every year or every other year. The IUIS uh, committee puts together a list of all the known genes. I'm not going to show you the whole paper, but this is the paper that has the 500 uh, genes that we call clinical genes. Okay, the second thing you need to do as you work up variants of unknown significance are to, or variants, is to classify them. Many times the reports will come back saying that this is a known pathogenic variant or a known benign variant or, um, or something in between. Uncertain significant variants don't mean to ignore it. It just means that we don't know what the variant does biochemically, uh, and, and we need to, you're going to need to help figure that out uh, as you work up patients. So again, how do you focus then on these VUSs? Is if you already have a known uh, gene and a known pathway, work on those first. But otherwise, pick the genes from your list that have the right inheritance pattern. For example, if mom has the variant but doesn't have the phenotype, maybe you're going to work on that one less. Maybe you're going to say this is less likely to be the cause of the immune deficiency. I'll keep it on my list, but I'll put it lower on my list. You can do a candidate gene approach. You can say, oh, this is a gene that I saw a paper on in a mouse. Uh, maybe you can uh, say this This is in the same pathway as a known mechanism. Uh, I have a patient who looks like hyper IgE syndrome. I know that's due to STAT3. Maybe it's also due to one of the kinases for STAT3. Huh, okay, maybe that's a good one to work on, a kinase for STAT3. So try to pick candidate genes that are based on the, the something, some knowledge you can bring uh, about the primary immunodeficiency genes that we know so far. 
The next thing you should work on is the predicted effects on proteins. A lot of times the uh, genetics people will tell you that there is a deleterious genetic variant. For example, a truncation variant, a stop codon got, that got thrown into the gene. That's going to really damage the transcript and may damage the gene. Those are good ones to work on if the phenotype you're working on is loss of function. If it's a genetic destruction of the, of the gene and the transcript, you're likely to have loss of function. Maybe, maybe not. But um, be careful that the, the, the loss of function variants like truncation variants and frame shifts are lower hanging fruit than the gain of function variants, as we'll talk about in a little bit. But, um, and that doesn't mean you should ignore the gain of function variants, but you may end up starting with some of the loss of function ones. And then the further, as you sort of select which variants you want to work on, which variants of unknown significance you want to work on, uh, try to pick the ones that have the right expression patterns. If you're looking at a patient with has a T cell phenotype, they have lots of weird warts and viral infections and 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 autoimmunity. Maybe you're gonna um, or lymphopenia. You may want to find those genes that are expressed in T cells. Don't go after the genes that are only expressed in neutrophils or in cardiac cells. Those genes aren't going to be as important to you as you narrow down your list and pick which ones you want to work on most. Pick the ones where the genes are expressed in the tissues that, that, that you're interested in. So I'm going to show you all this stuff and, and then a pipeline on how to evaluate each of these. Um, a, a further thing that we try to do is understand the functional impact of a variant by asking where the variant lands in a protein and say, is this an important part of the protein? Like if you if you if you fire a uh, a torpedo at a battleship and it hits right in the middle where the engine is, that's an important part of the battleship. You're likely to sink the ship or or at least disable it. Whereas if a torpedo hits, you know the uh, the place where the anchor is attached, okay, that might be important to holding the ship, but it's not going to prevent it from attacking you or sailing away. Uh, and so different parts of the gene uh, where the variants land are going to have different functional impacts, and there's ways of predicting that stuff and looking through software. And then again, tissue expression or cellular expression matters a lot. Looking at the estimating the pathogenicity of the variant based on its rareness and how much damage it causes is very important. And then I would encourage you as you're making these narrowing the list of VUSs to the ones you really want to work on the most, uh, use your use your um, mice brethren as friends. Uh, they will help you. The mouse immune system is in extensively studied and it offers a very good parallel to the human immune system. You can learn a lot by Googling and reading some of the mouse immunity papers where this gene might have been knocked out and it gives you a hint about what the immune impact is. Okay, how do we tell which genes are expressed in which cells? Um, we use the website called ImGen. ImGen allows you to type in the name of a gene and it pops up very quickly through RNA sequencing, uh, which cells express which genes and how much. This is the gene called Pietrokinase P1 Delta or PIK3CD. This gene is expressed transcriptionally in a variety of cell types, and you can see it's expressed quite a bit in T cells. Here's naive CD4 T cells. It's expressed quite a bit. Naive CD8 T cells expressed quite a bit. Um, and you can see it's expressed in, in dendritic cells a lot less, but still quite a bit. In B cells less, but still quite a bit. In fact, in a lot of these cells, it's expressed quite a bit. That's a, a pervasively expressed gene. You'll find other genes where these numbers are low in some cell types and higher in others. And again, it could be used useful as you try to narrow down the phenotypes, which genes you want to work on. Say you want to understand where in the gene the variant hits. You can do, um, you could go to NIH gene website, just, uh, you could just Google NIH gene, it takes you here. You could type in the name of the gene into this box, pick 3 cd and then scroll through it and try to find the name of the reference sequence. These are called ref seeks. The reference sequences are NIH's idea of what the main reference sequence is for this gene, for this transcript. And it'll give you a transcriptional uh, nucleotide version of it called NM or a protein version of it called NP. And you can copy this NP code out of the NIH gene and paste it into um, the NIH conserved domain search website. See, I just pasted it right here and then hit run or submit. And then what it returns back to you are the domains of the protein and, and their amino acid sequence. Now you can take your variant, like say I have a mutation in, in, in amino acid 535, and I'm going to wonder, is this causing a problem for this patient? Well, I can see that 535 lands right in the middle of this PI3 superfamily uh, uh, region, and it might be very important for the function of the gene. Uh, and then I
I'll say, oh, wow, this is landing in a highly conserved, functionally important domain of the protein. This is going to be potentially more interesting, more useful to work on, uh, maybe the cause of the patient's disease. Whereas if it fell somewhere in the in, uh, regions where there is less conserved sequence, then there's a lower chance of it having a biological impact, not zero, just a lower chance. This is a way of sort of helping you uh, ascertain is the variant in a relevant domain and how are we going to validate this variant? How likely is the variant to be del deleterious? There are computational approaches to doing this. There's one um, where it's called a CAD score that allows you to uh, measure the likelihood of it being deleterious. And you also look at how rare things are. Remember that mantra I said in the beginning, um, genes have to be, the disorders that we go after, uh, if they're caused by a monogenic variant, the variant has to be rare because the, the disorder is rare. Rare diseases require rare variants. And this website, um, uh, I'll show you in a second, called uh, PopFair, allows you to look at the populational frequency or the minor allele frequency. You can also find all the frequencies of all the interesting variants <clears throat> that have been sequenced thus far on NOMAD. So um, this is one from Yuval Itan's group at Rockefeller, and he has, uh, if you type in, the, type in the name of the gene, in this case I did PF3 kinase P110 delta, you can see all the public variants that are known out there, how rare they are, this is less rare, this is more rare, and then how deleterious they are. Anything over 20 has a, has a possibility of being uh, deleterious. Um, and so if your variant is here, that is pretty rare, one in 10,000, and also a, a CAD score of 24, now you're holding your, your cards very well and you can say, oh, this is an interesting variant. It fell in an interesting domain, it's rare, and it's been predicted to be deleterious uh, by CAD. Wow, this could be really the cause of my patient's disease. In the end though, you need a functional assay to test the variants of unknown significance. Uh, and you may do this in your own lab by doing biochemical assays, Western blots, flow cytometry, FOS flow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or you may phone a friend to do it. Uh, if you don't have any friends, um, <laughs> you will. If you're new to immunology, you will meet, get to meet all of us over the course of uh, meetings and whatnot. And we're out here to help you. There is a website, I mean, an email list called CISVUS Serve, where you can post uh, the, the patient's phenotypes and the genes that you found and the variants and ask for help. And people out there will, we will respond to you uh, often within hours or days and say, oh, that's not an interesting variant. I had one like that and I validated it. Or, oh, I can help you validate that variant with a functional assay. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second um, and ask uh, if there are any questions. I'm gonna turn off screen sharing. I'm gonna uh, just ask anybody have any questions so far? Hi, Manish. Hey. Hey, hey, how are you? Uh, good to see you here. <clears throat> uh, excellent uh, information here. I was wondering if you use the same uh, pipelines every single time or you kind of mix and match with all the vari various pipelines that are available. It seems like it, this is a time consuming process till you are not very well, well versed with it. So just wondering if you always go to the same pipelines. Uh, for the most part, these are, yeah, nothing is the same every time, but of, oftentimes you, I'll start by looking on Google Scholar to see if anyone's published this variant. If it's so, I've already jumped to the answer. Uh, a lot of times if it's a gene that I know really well, I'll go straight to the expert. Like if it's a, a variant in CARD 11 and I haven't found a paper on it, I'll just go ahead and email Andy Snow directly and say, hey Andy, do you have, do you have any information about this variant? Uh, I won't look on the conserved domains. I won't do anything. I'll just go straight to the expert. Uh, so sure. yeah, sometimes you'll bypass some of these steps and just go straight to someone if you know someone um, is working on these things for sure. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's painstaking and, and you're right. I mean, we uh, would say, I would say that you will spend um, probably between 10 and 50 hours per patient as you work up their genetics, <clears throat> it's all unreimbursed time. Um, you may see them in clinic for 45 minutes, and you may spend 50 times as much time on their genetics afterwards, uh, entirely unreimbursed. And your department chairs and your uh, bosses out there won't care that you're spending all this time unreimbursed, but this is what we do. This is how we work yeah. up rare diseases, is that we dive into their genetics and, and try to flesh things out. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So just that's useful. stick with it, though. It, it is really rewarding when you can make these diagnoses. Are, are there any other questions out there? Or otherwise, I'll go on for the last few minutes to talk about gain of function diseases, sure. and then we'll take more questions. That's good. Thanks. OK, so I'll go back to here and here. OK, I think we'll keep going. So this is an example of a validational assay done by Andy Snow on a patient that we found who had uh, a severe lymphoproliferative phenotype and lots of autoimmunity, a little child, uh, and turned out to have a mutation in CARD11 gene. It was a duplication of, of five amino acids. And what we found is that there was a gain of function. What Andy found is that there was a gain of function. Uh, the cells, even when unstimulated, showed a lot of activation of NF-kappa B, and that's a hallmark of CARD11 gain of function. Here's an example of STAT1 gain of function where the cells are stimulated and they produce a lot of phosphorylation of STAT1 as compared with a healthy control. That's an example of a gain of function disorder. Okay, so now let me jump into these gain of function disorders since I've, I've sort of hinted at them. <clears throat> I used to think that when you find a mutation in a gene that there is a, a breakage of the gene. Hey, Manish. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I don't know if your slides were advancing, so just a oh. Okay. Uh huh. Are you able to see the power, the 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 keynote? Now we can. Now I think. Now, can, now does yeah. it look like a full screen with a picture? Uh, it, uh, with the fish hooks? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. So this is the gain of function disorder. This is showing an increase in the card eleven gain of function. But let me jump into gain of function disorders. So I used to think that when you mutate a protein, a gene, that you're going to lose function. The fish hook becomes less useful. That's the intuition, right? That when you break something, it's broken. But we actually find a lot of disorders now where when you mutate something, you mutate it in the area where the off switch is and the protein turns on. It becomes a gain of biochemical function. It's still an immunological loss of function sometimes. The, the T cells don't work well. They're not working properly. That's why the patient comes to you. But the biochemistry is turned on extra, and that extra is called gain of function. Gain of function disorders can be dominant. They only require one hit. And as we learn more and more about patients who don't have parental um, inheritance of, of rare recessive variants, we have to start thinking about the dominant variants, the de novo diseases that arise in a child without any inheritance from the parents. Many of those are going to be dominant uh, disorders that are gain of function. And so it's important to start thinking about gain of function diseases. Um, you're going to see here a list I've tried to compile based on a paper from 2015, but adding on year upon year, more and more of the genetic variants. We have over 40 gain of function diseases now uh, in immunology. And the phenotypes can be everything from infection susceptibility in the patients who have EPDS2 uh, or uh, EPDS1 or Benta to, uh, to severe allergic phenotypes like in CARD14 gain of function to patients who have autoinflammation. You can see lots of genes in this corner of the diagram because gain of inflammatory function creates autoinflammation. So many of the inflammasomopathies like an LRC4, an LRP12, an LRP1 uh, are in this corner. You'll see autoimmune gain of function diseases, uh, including uh, patients who have gain of function in STAT3, gain of function in STAT1, now also gain of function in STAT5, STAT2, and STAT6, all published in the last year. Um, so we have lots and lots of other autoimmune uh, gain of function diseases uh, that create monogenic autoimmune diseases. There's also gains of function that create a susceptibility to lymphomas or malignancies, including PIK3CD and Benta, uh, but also in Icaros and in, 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 in um, uh, the gain of function that's called WIM syndrome. So you have to become familiar with the gain of function diseases because they are managed differently than the more classic immune deficiencies that are loss of function. When something is a loss of function, you fill the hole. There's a hole. You fill it. You fill it with immunoglobin. You fill it with a bone marrow transplant so that they can have T cells again or whatever it may be. Uh, the gain of function diseases are philosophically different. There is not a hole that you are filling. There is an overactivity. And we have to come up with a whole new way of thinking and treating these disorders. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through some of these. Uh, so imagine there's a signal, a biochemical signal, like a cytokine, interferon alpha. There is a receptor for that signal, like an interferon alpha receptor. There's a pathway turned on by the signal, like, for example, STAT1, phosphorylated by JAK1 in this case. And then there's genes that are turned on as a result of the pathway, uh, for example, all the antiviral genes that are turned on by interferons. Gain-of-function disorders can occur at the level of the signal, 
at the level of the receptor, at the level of the pathway, or at the level, or anywhere in between, and it can result then in some genes being turned on extra, uh, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a case, a 29-year-old who had chest pain, who had, did not have, um, who has had a cough, but no other Sorry cough. to interrupt. Oh. Yeah. Uh, can someone else confirm that they are seeing the case? Okay, now I can see the case, but it's not advancing for some, it's not in the presentation okay. mode. Oh, yeah, you should have interrupted me earlier. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. here are the games. All, All right. right, perfect. Yeah, but Here's it's not in presentation. I'll just show it to you in this view, so hopefully you guys can just see it. I don't really understand. This is why I hate Microsoft Teams. <laughs> the presentations usually have problems. Anyway, here are the genes, uh, many of the auto-inflammatory genes here. Uh, um, here are the pathways like interferon, uh, turning on STAT and turning on genes, and how you can have gene and function mutations affecting the signal, the receptor, the pathway, or the genes. And then let's jump, jump to a case. A 29-year-old who has a productive cough and um, and has uh, had a history of thrush and onychomycosis and a couple of pneumonias starting at age 19, now has a fever, no travel history, has some siblings with infections, and graduated from college and lives with her parents. Um, this is her workup showing uh, leukocytosis uh, and uh, is ill-appearing uh, with lower lobe consolidation on physical exam, a chest x-ray that confirms a pneumonia, and uh, each flu that's cultured upon uh, getting fluid. And you start her on antibiotics, you notice um, her face here also includes not just thrush, but also um, a, a, a inflammatory a rash on the skin. If you scrape this, you'll find candida on the skin. Uh, when you well, Now you want to know what kind of testing to do in this patient, uh, a, a subject of another talk, but certainly you want to test the numbers of cells. Does she have T cells and B cells? Are there switched memory B cells? Does she have antibodies? Do the antibodies work? If you vaccinate her or if she's had recent vaccinations, does she make specific antibodies and T cell responses? Um, if you're going to call her an antibody deficiency, you you know, you want to make sure her T cells are normal. Maybe you want to test complement function. So there's a number of tests that you do that are both numerical and functional. And then you'll often want to do genetic testing as part of the workup of these kinds of patients. Maybe you find that she's mildly hypogam. Maybe you find that she has very poor antibody responses to vaccine antigens. And maybe um, you find that she has a genetic variant, a heterozygous variant in a gene. At this point, you may ask yourself, okay, what does STAT1 uh, a mutation at, at, at alanine 267 portent to, for her. She asks you, what does this mean? Like, do I have an immune deficiency? Uh, and 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 is it a is it a deficiency? Uh, what we know from this variant is, and what we can speculate from a heterozygous variant is that this might be a gain of function variant, uh, because gain of function stat one patients have often thrush, recurrent viral infections, and some autoimmunity. Uh, and so the way we diagnose gain of function disorders, maybe you phone a friend, maybe you ask someone on the listserv, is to stimulate cells like monocytes with interferon and ask how's the phosphorylation over the course of the first three hours. You may find that there's an ex excess phosphorylation of STAT1, and that's an often uh, a, a way of triggering uh, the gene and asking, is there a gain of function? Yes, it is an increased function. So STAT1 gain of function is probably one of the gain of function immune deficiencies you are going to see quite a bit over the next few years. And the and phenotypes include many, many, many infections. Almost all of them have thrush. Many of them have bacterial pneumonias. Um, but you'll also find non-infectious diseases, including lots of autoimmunity and even vasculitis uh, and um, vascular diseases. About one in 16 of these patients dies of a aneurysm. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, non-infectious phenotypes too. So again, back to our model of an increased activation at the signal, receptor, inhibitor, uh, in pathway or genes, gain of function STAT1 is a gain of function in the, stat, in the pathway. And now when we think about treating these disorders, we think about applying an inhibitor, maybe above or below the variant or uh, all the way up here at the level of the signal itself. Um, for example, in STAT1 gain of function, many of these STAT1s are turned on by cytokines like interferon alpha. So maybe you want to block the interferon alpha receptor using a monoclonal like anaphrolamine. Maybe you want to block the phosphorylation of STAT1 by blocking the kinase, JAK1 and TIC2, using ruxolitinib, a, a kinase uh, inhibitor. So these are the kinds of treatments you're going to reach for, not just immunoglobulin. 
but you want to try to block the gain of function. And philosophically, what you're doing is taking a gain of function where the engine is running too hot and bring them back down to normal wild type function. You don't want to over suppress them. You don't want to bring their function all the way down to loss of function because you'll create a different immune deficiency as a result. Instead of having stat one gain of function, they'll have stat one loss of function because of your treatment. So you want to be able to pick doses and treatments that are less than the cancer people use that the uh, other folks are using and try to bring them back to normal function. How do we test that? It requires monitoring. And so you have to really be able to do laboratory tests to follow the interferons and the phosphorylation of these genes. Um, another example is APDS, another gain of function disease. This is a gain of function of the pathway. P3 kinase P110 delta is downstream of some of the receptors like CD3, uh, CD28 and NICOS. And you may want to block then the receptors. You may want to block downstream of P3 kinase. But now we have a targeted therapy called lineolisib that just got its FDA approval a few months ago and allows you to very much target the, gene, the, the, the kinase itself and turn it down, bring it down to normal function. Another genetic disease, STAT3 gain of function, um, is we don't have a treatment to block STAT3, but we can block upstream of it. The kinase can be blocked by tofacitinib. The receptors that turn on STAT3, including STAT6, can be blocked by uh, tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6 receptor. Or you may block the, the cytokine itself by using IL-6 blocking cytokines. So um, the yeah, the key take-home points at the end of this now are um, all the patients need genetic diagnoses and deserve them. Uh, don't ignore VUSs. There are over 500 genes. You're, this is, you're going to have a very hard time following all these genes. Instead, focus on pathways, not on individual genes. Immunoglobulin replacement therapy is not enough for many of our patients now, especially those who have gain-of-function diseases. You really want to be able to identify the gain-of-function disease, test it biochemically, and then pick rational treatments based on the gain-of-function diseases. And there are many, many, whether it's an IL-1 blocker like canakinumab or, or anakinra that you might use for the inflammasomopathies, or, IL, um, or interferon blockers for the for the stats or cytokine blockers for other stats, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots and lots of rational treatments now, and you're going to be able to employ them to help your patients uh, in, in a lot of cases more than just the immunoglobulin replacement therapy uh, uh, could have offered. But the way to get to that is focusing on pathways, not on individual genes, and then pick treatments based on the pathways. Okay, I'm going to stop here and uh, for the last few minutes, take some questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? You can just unmute and turn on your camera and uh, hopefully this is helpful to you. It's, it's extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, the, the old phrase, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And now I recognize I don't know a lot, <laughs> but but I'm learning on this process too. Um, I'm sure for the first years, it may be a little overwhelming to, to walk into, um, yeah. you know, a lot of, because we're still on the very early stage of learning about Im immune deficiencies and, and yeah. pathways and all, but um, that will co all come with time and more exposure. Um, so we, we appreciate this opportunity to learn this. So anyway, let's open it up for any questions out there. Okay. So one of your comments was about the, you know, the number of hours, 10 to 50 hours to work these things up. And it, of course, administration doesn't re recognize all this. And it's a very much a true thing. The other thing I was thinking about, um, like genetic panels for your skids patients and all, you mentioned like $250. And I think of the number of hours it takes me to get it approved through either genetics or insurance. Yeah. And I'm going, really, I could have paid out of pocket. It would have been more cost effective. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, it's true. Getting the authorizations is very hard. Many of the payers don't want to pay for these tests, even though there are very clear actionability for them. This is all about them taking premiums and turning them into profits rather than into health care. You know, but this is the system that we live in right now. Uh, your obligation will be to fight for the genetic tests so that eventually you can fight for the targeted therapies. Um, and, and the payers will do everything they can to block you because they want those dollars as profits rather than to spend them. Um, the gene panels offer sort of a shortcut. Many of our patients won't balk at a $250 test or remember that the Modell Foundation offers free testing for a lot of patients. 
um, about 10 free tests a year for each of you. If you go to the Jeffrey Modell Foundation and go to Jeffrey's Insights, uh, they will sign you up and you can offer, you can do 10 free tests a year. Uh, that goes a long way for a lot of the fellows, especially if you group together and you may have 30, 40, 50 uh, uh, tests available based on the attendings and the fellows in various programs. The other thing you can do is um, uh, if they have a lymphoproliferative phenotype, you can uh, send the costs to the way of farming. They'll pay for some of those tests. And if you have a patient who has a neutropenic phenotype, um, you can send the, the cost to X4. They'll pay for the in vitae test. So there's a company, a couple companies now that will pay for the genetic testing so your patient doesn't have to pay in anything if 250 bucks is too much. And the in vitae test, by the way, for many insurance companies will drop all the way down to about 80 bucks. So it's really actually gets pretty affordable. And I know a lot of our patients in LA can't afford even that, but it is um, it gets there. Boy, this is uh, maybe too much. I'm gonna simplify this lecture for next year. Uh, I tried to provide a sort of higher level overview here, but hopefully it wasn't too uh, too much for you guys. And hopefully over the course of this year, you will get an exposure to patients with inborn errors of immunity, genetic testing, working them up. And then, um, you know, I'm gonna give the slides to Nikki and then you'll be able to um, go back to this as a reference. You certainly can feel free to email me. I think my email address was on the last slide. I'm happy to help. Sure. Quick question for the uh, the depth of the reads. Uh, do you look for a particular because we do a lot of testing in house. So yeah. when we don't have a good answer or we don't know if it was if a gene was covered or not, and if it had good depth, we reach out and ask about it. Um, but for if, is it different for different genes or is it like a yeah, it's different for different reading. exons. As I showed, some exons are covered with very little, like only 10 reads or less. And then some exons are covered very well, like 80 reads or 100 reads. So if you're finding a variant, um, uh, if you're not finding any variants, you may ask, did you do enough coverage of these genes that I want to really know? This is a patient with lymphoproliferation. This is a patient with thrush. This is a patient with, with weird IgM positive Bs, whatever it may be. You may then pick a set of genes and say to the people, please make sure there's enough coverage for these genes. If not, can we get a little more coverage for these genes? Because I really want to know if there's a variant there. What is enough coverage? Certainly 30 reads is enough. Uh, okay. 10 is even potentially enough. No, maybe not though. 10 sort of is at the point where you may miss, you may miss it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. Anybody else out there? We'll be meeting okay. out punishments to the UCLA fellows who aren't asking questions <laughs> later. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, again, we appreciate you being here and contributing to Coca-Cola. Um, and, um, and I know we all learned quite a bit today. Um, a lot more to go, but we're going to get there. Um, so every, for all the fellows hanging there on this, it, um, it's a lot of this is new information even for your attending. So um, we'll get through it together. But anyway, I appreciate you sharing your your expertise today. And uh, we'll, we'll get this um, Upload it. We have a little editing to do. We'll get this uploaded in the next couple of weeks on the uh, YouTube channel so other people can watch it uh, asynchronously. Great. So, thank you for okay. being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good morning, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.